The JFK 35 podcast is made possible through generous support from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. We are going to put together the largest peaceful protest in the history of this nation. How big? 100,000 people. That was Oscar-nominated Best Actor Coleman Domingo portraying civil rights activist Bayard Rustin. In a new Netflix film, Domingo plays the charismatic activist who served key roles in organizing the largest single demonstration in the United States for its time. We'll talk with the producers of the film, and also a historian who was there in August 1963 when Rustin and an estimated 250,000 people marched on Washington. All that coming up on this episode of JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hello, I'm Matt Porter. And I'm Jamie Richardson. Welcome to the first episode of the new season of JFK 35. On August 28, 1963, a quarter of a million people of different races, religions, and economic backgrounds convened on the nation's capital for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. While leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., A. Philip Randolph, and John Lewis are remembered for their powerful words to the crowd that day, there was one man who didn't make a speech, but left an indelible mark on the march. His name was Bayard Rustin. Rustin, a man who believed in nonviolent protests, served as a mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. and others. He was also a gay black man living in an era when that was still illegal in some parts of the United States. He was a charismatic community organizer and served as the deputy director and principal organizer of the march under A. Philip Randolph. Without him, many say the march could not have happened as it did. His story is told in a new Netflix film produced by Higher Ground Media, a production company started by Barack and Michelle Obama. Here is a clip of actor Coleman Domingo, who portrayed Rustin and is nominated for a Best Actor Award in next week's Academy Awards. In the clip, Rustin is having a conversation with white police officers from Washington, D.C., on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, where Martin Luther King and others would speak. On the day of your march, the entire D.C. police force has been mobilized. Along with 500 reserves, 2,500 National Guard, 4,000 Army soldiers, and per orders of the Pentagon, 19,000 troops. Well, I hope you'll have something for them to do, because they will not be needed here. And whoever has direct dealings with Mr. Hoover, let him know that on August 28th, black, white, young, old, rich, working class, poor, will descend on Washington, D.C., and there's nothing he can do to stop it. Joining me now are producers Tonya Davis and Bruce Cohen. Tonya serves as head of motion pictures for Higher Ground Media. She's executive produced the documentary Becoming, about Michelle Obama, the Oscar-nominated documentary Crip Camp, and the critically acclaimed animated series Ada Twist. Under her leadership, Higher Ground also presented feature films, including Fatherhood, starring Kevin Hart, and Worth, based on former JFK Library Foundation chairman Kenneth Feinberg and his memoir, What Is Life Worth? Tonya and Higher Ground recently executive produced the movie Leave the World Behind, starring Julia Roberts and Mahershala Ali, which hit the number five spot in Netflix's most popular films, with more than 140 million views in its first 73 days. Bruce is an Oscar and Tony-winning, Emmy-nominated producer of film, television, theater, and live events. He won an Academy Award for Best Picture for American Beauty and earned additional Best Picture nominations for Milk and Silver Linings Playbook. He produced several Broadway plays and musicals, including winning the Tony for Best Play in 2020 for co-producing Matthew Lopez's The Inheritance. And he received a Tony nomination for co-producing Jeremy O'Harris's Slave Play. He is currently co-chair of the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. Tonya and Bruce, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having us. It's great to be here. Great. Um, and I want to start before we get into the film. How did you both come to find yourself with this script and the idea of this film in front of you about um, civil rights activist Bayard Rustin? Uh, Dustin Lance Black, who is one of the screenwriters, along with Julian Brees, had sent me the screenplay that they had worked on together. I actually knew who Bayard Rustin was because there was a fantastic 
documentary called Brother Outsider that I had seen in the 90s. So he'd sort of been someone in the back of my mind of an unsung hero and an LGBT icon that had never gotten his due. So when Lance, who I had worked with on Milk, let me know that he had been working on a script about Bayard, I was very excited to read it. I was even more excited once I read it and really wanted to do everything humanly possible to get it made. And fortuitously, right around that same time is when Higher Ground, the production company run by the Obamas, had opened with their deal at Netflix. And as I was learning that more and more people in Hollywood had never heard of Bayard Rustin, I do remember thinking to myself, well, I know one person who knows who Bayard Rustin is. And the person who I was thinking of is the gentleman who had bestowed upon Rustin the Presidential Medal of Freedom posthumously at, on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, and that was President Barack Obama. So when I saw that he now had a production company along with Michelle, that's what gave me the idea to send the script to Tonya, and thank goodness I did. And Tonya, what was it like when Bruce came to you with the Rustin script and idea? Um, well, if, first of all, it was thrilling because I didn't know Bruce yet in, personally, but I knew his work um, and had long been an admirer of a number of the films that he'd produced, including Milk, including Silver Linings Playbook, including American Beauty. And so I was receiving a phone call from Bruce Cohen, came in as a message left for me over lunch um, regarding Bayard Rustin, a name that I'd really only heard when my now boss, President Obama, had given him this medal. And so I called Bruce back right away. We introduced ourselves, introduced ourselves quickly. And then he sent me this beautiful screenplay. And as soon as he explained to me what the project was, the scope of the timeline that, you know, we were um, going to be working through and telling and um, the really goals of the project creatively, not to mention that George C. Wolfe, who um, was a director I'd always admired, but who most recently had made this film, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. As soon as Bruce sort of started talking, I was jumping for joy and saying yes right away and just started to try to formulate how I was going to talk to President and Mrs. Obama about it. This was going to be our, you know, our first film um, from higher ground. And I got this whole pitch prepared. I wrote it out. I practiced in front of the mirror. And then as soon as I got on the phone with President Obama, I said, we also received a screenplay from, you know, these great producer and this great screenwriter, and it's about Bayard Rustin. And then I prepared to go into this long explanation and this long speech. And Obama just said, that sounds terrific. We should do that one for sure. Let me read it. Um, and then he read it and fell in love with it, um, as I did. So we got involved. Bruce was producing the project for a number of years before Higher Ground even existed. Um, and then we got involved and together took the movie to Netflix, George Wolf directing, and got it up on its feet. And so what was it for you about Rustin's story that you made that made both of you think this could be a powerful film for today's audience? I had the general idea and dream that it was a huge problem and shame that no one knew who Bayard Rustin was. But what I didn't know until I read the screenplay was the extraordinary story of how he had the idea for and then pulled off the March on Washington. And one of the seminal character relations in the film, which is him and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who they had been very close. Bayard had been a mentor of his. Bayard is the one who'd really taught Dr. King about nonviolence. And then, slight spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the film, but their, their arc, which is all completely true to history, which is that Dr. King was not able to stand up against the forces of homophobia and allowed Bayard to be basically fired from the movement in 1960, and then the arc that led Dr. King to being able to stand up for Bayard very strongly just before the march in 1963. So in addition to this brilliantly important historical story that had been lost, there was this incredible personal story at the center of it. So just started feeling like a really good movie to me. Antonio, was there anything that grabbed at you um, about the script that you thought this is perfect for today? Well, it, it's it was the notion that in order to do your best work, you had to be who you are and your in your full 
um, naked self publicly. And so it was the notion that your power was going to come from your own authenticity and honesty and from celebrating yourself and your differences rather than hiding them. And that is a hugely powerful piece of Bayard's story. Um, you know, Bayard was an openly gay man in an era when that wasn't at all uh, the norm. And he suffered, uh, rather, he faced potential real consequences in his job and his career and, and his also personal safety to do that and to be that. And to tell the story of how um, he was able to stand in his own truth and using that truth in many respects was able to really change the course of history it was just an incredible story and an inspiring one to be a part of an inspiring one um, we thought and we hoped for audiences um, in this country and around the world. And so how do you tell that story? You know, he was a complex figure. He had this pacifism that put him in jail in World War II. He was obviously, as you said, uh, a, a gay man in a world where that was not something you could be public about. Uh, and then at the same time, here he is sort of in the in the shadows organizing what becomes the largest demonstration in the nation's capital. How do you tell that story and do it justice? Well, everything you just said is part of why it's a great story. There's so many elements. Um, he's got so many obstacles. So that all hopefully leads towards good movie making. As far as doing it justice, that's always the challenge of, well, pretty much every film or TV show in general, but specifically true stories, because you're, you're never going to actually be able to tell the story in all of its detail as it actually happened, you're always needing to find out, f figure out what's the way in, in particular that uh, that that we want to tell. And I think in this case, one of the the big leaps that really paid off that Julian and Lance made was to focus on the March on Washington itself. We have a little bit of the story that starts with the backstory in 1960, as I mentioned, because it's the setup of the Dr. Martin Luther King relationship. But the, most of the film is in the months leading up to the March on Washington. And that decision to tell that story as opposed to trying to do a soup to nuts biography of Bayard Rustin, we all believe very strongly in that story. And I think the film is proof that that was, that was a, a brilliant move because it's centering the story around a very specific incident, a very specific amount of time. And that's, in my opinion, often a lot easier to make a great movie of a true story than if you're trying to show someone's whole life in two hours, which is pretty much impossible to do justice to. You know, speaking of the focusing on the March on Washington, I think part of what gets missed today is that everyone thinks the march happened, everyone was happy about it, everyone went, had this amazing day, and it was done, and it was perfect. And your story really shows that there were a number of breaking points, and, you know, a lot of people were divided. Should they picket the White House, too, or, you know, who, who goes out? How long do they stay? And it wasn't perfect. It, it took a lot of finesse to, to pull it off, and that's why you have this character, Rustin, who was gathering all these parties together, but... Talk about that, how you had to basically tell a story that most people probably thought wasn't as complex as it turned out to be. So the Obamas are almost more than anything uh, originally grassroots community organizers. And so one of the reasons that President Obama was so excited about this movie in particular and this perspective on the story from Julian and Lance and George was that it didn't it didn't cover up any of the backroom um, complications of what it takes to plan a march like like this and to plan collective action, but instead really celebrated all of the different machinations, the political uh, complications, backstabbing, et cetera, and then how Bayard and his team of organizers were able to navigate through that to create this sort of once in a lifetime, once in a generation, gigantic public display of unity. So in terms of, you know, why we wanted to show that and how we showed that, that was actually part of very, very, very beginning conversation of what do we hope to accomplish? And one of the things that we hope to accomplish was showing that the impossible is possible. 
Um, but it doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen without every single person making compromises and sacrifices and coming into the room and being able to argue and disagree until you reach conclusion. You know, we all know that the March on Washington didn't change anything overnight for so many people and 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 so much of the civil rights journey, you know, happened afterwards and is still happening. Um, but it was this symbol and this moment of great unity that was compiled by and put together by a number of different factions who came together because they had a reason to and saw the greater purpose in doing so. What was the significant, I mean, the challenge really of getting the right director and the right cast for this film? Like you've got a star studded cast, director is awesome, but all those things have to come together. And what was that like finding the right mix of people to do this movie right? Well, I would, I'd start by saying one of the things Tonya and I learned on this movie is if you, as a producer, want a world-class superlative cast to give extraordinary performances, hire George C. Wolf to be your director. Everything else kind of flows from there. George is just such a brilliant visionary. He's really one of the great directors working today. He's a true actor's director. And when it came to our specific cast, he also has an ensemble of actors that between Broadway and films, he's worked with again and again that will pretty much put aside anything in their schedules to work with him, including Colma Domingo and Audra McDonald and Jeffrey Wright and Glenn Turman, and the list goes on and on. So yes, we understood that we needed the perfect director and an absolutely extraordinary cast to really make sure the film lived up to its full potential. And I think we got that with George and all of the actors that came on board to be a part of his journey. It really did come together so well. With the 1960s, you cover this era. It's an era of demonstrations and protest and activism. How do you guys look at that from the film and then kind of look at today's activism and focus on civil rights and now LGBTQ rights being out there? Uh, Do you draw any similarities from the fights they were having, the style of how they had their activism from then to now. You know, in addition to being an incredible filmmaker, Bruce Cohen is also an activist in this exact space. And so he is the perfect person to answer the question. I'll say for me, the parallels are almost scary. The tactics are different. The tools available are different, um, but the intentions um, feel very, very similar. That was one of the things, and thank you, Tonya, for those nice words. One of the truly shocking things for us making the film was not just how relevant the and necessary the message of the film and the retelling of what happened was when we started trying to get the movie made before COVID, but shockingly, how much it was even more relevant once once the movie came out. I mean, we sort of wa- we watched history start to go backwards as far as LGBTQ rights, as far as civil rights in the in the course of the film. So it was quite bracing bringing it out last year in the winter of 2023. There's a, a line in the film where um, early on in the film, Bayard Rustin says, counting on the courts to eradicate discrimination, that's madness. Well, that was true in 1960, in the early 1960s. And then we had a long period where as Americans, we became spoiled to believe that it actually might be the Supreme Court's job to eradicate discrimination. And in fact, in case after case after case, that's what they were doing, was trying to move towards a more just America to more closely live up to the all men are created equal, which should, of course, been all humans are created equal, credos of our founding. But now the movie comes out last year. We're in a period where the Supreme Court is actually taking away rights that we have, taking them back away from us, decision after decision. And that's something that we couldn't have ever imagined, even in 2018, when we started doing the film. So it was a real wake up call to 
how this movie's message is more relevant today than ever. Wow. A reminder that Rustin's words are still true today. I just have a couple more questions. This one's for Tonya about higher ground media. President and Mrs. Kennedy were always fierce advocates of the arts and proponents that the arts can inform and educate. They had many artists come to the White House. They started that, restarted that tradition. And I kind of think of President Obama and Mrs. Obama similarly. And now that they're out of the White House, they're continuing that leadership by forming this company. It's for us as of the Kennedy Library, it feels so connected to us. How do you feel about the mission of Higher Ground and what you hope to continue to accomplish in your next couple of years and whatever you produce? Yeah. Um, thank you for drawing that parallel and for asking the question. So actually, President and Mrs. Obama's love of the arts started way before they were in the White House together. Um, one of their first dates famously was to a movie together. And so they'd always not only been huge supporters of the arts, but actually really found connection with each other and with and, and through their family and inside of their family, rather, through the arts. Um, when they were in the White House, they hosted Every major singer, songwriter, you know, playwright, Lin Manuel Miranda came and performed Hamilton. They went on dates to New York City uh, occasionally. I heard, I heard that Hamilton thing did really well, by the way. <laughs> that Hamilton thing did really. That Hamilton thing did really well. And in fact, Bruce Springsteen came before he was on Broadway and did that show actually mm-hmm. for the president as well. And so they always felt not only that it was their job um, in the White House to really support arts and culture, um, American arts and culture, but um, and to, and to give it a big stage, but also to really celebrate both the artists that you've heard of and also the artists that you maybe haven't yet heard of. That extended even when they were having their national portraits done in the portrait, um, you know, in the portrait gallery, famously choosing Gehinde Wiley, um, an artist who was well known, but certainly <laughs> doing the portraits of President and Mrs. Obama um, catapulted him into a, a new a new stratosphere. So they've always felt that it was part of their mission to tell stories and to bring people together through that storytelling, that essentially 99.999% of us are identical in every way, and that we're always focused on that 0.0001 piece of differences among us. But if we can actually connect through storytelling, find the common humanity, that, that the world would be just a little bit of a kinder, better place. So in terms of higher ground media, what we are circling now, what we're doing next, the amazing partnership we've had with Bruce and George and Lance and um, on the movie Rustin, the goals and the mission of the company are very much as they have always been, which is to tell stories, you know, aligned with our values, with filmmakers who share those values and can push us into, you know, high quality, wonderful films and television shows, um, and to do so for a broad, wide audience. You know, the Obamas want to meet the audience where they are and tell stories that are appealing to people to watch and to think through and that hopefully make the world just a little bit of a more connected place. Well, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to the next project. And Bruce, maybe this question is for you or for both of you, but when this episode airs, it'll be about a week before the big Oscar night, your best actor, Coleman Domingo, getting a nomination. For many people, they're going to watch the Oscars and see that, you know, Oscar moment clip that people talk about, and they'll see his brief snippet of Rustin. And for many, that might be the first time they they are introduced to the character. What do you hope people who don't have knowledge of Bayard Rustin will learn and take away after watching the full film? Well, the larger dream of the whole project from the beginning was to give Bayard Rustin a place in history so that people know who he is moving forward, so that his name does not get lost and his deeds do not get lost. And that from now on, he's taught in history books and people know who he is and what he did and what a significant American he is. And so for us, Coleman getting the Oscar nomination for Best Actor is one of the largest and best ways to help make sure that that happens. And I will also add, though, that one thing George brought to the table, which we all completely supported, including Coleman, was that and in capital letters and while we're telling the story, we have to entertain. We all felt like if this movie was not as joyous and fun and charismatic and lively as Bayard Rustin was himself, 
that Bayard would come back from his grave and kick all of our butts. So the hope uh, of the takeaway, certainly for people who haven't heard anything about the movie yet, but for the hundreds of millions of people around the world who see the great clip that we'll choose and get to be introduced to Coleman on the Academy Awards is that they'll watch the film and that there'll be another notch on the list, the ever growing list of people around the world who now know who Byron Rustin is and what he did. Well, I wish you all the best of luck. And I hope that the Oscars are just another springboard for you all and that many, many more watch this movie. It is available on Netflix. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Pleasure to be here. While the Netflix film will introduce Bayard Rustin's name to new audiences around the world, the history of the entire march will also be highlighted. Joining us to talk about Bayard Rustin and the historic nature of the March on Washington is historian and Martin Luther King Jr. Centennial Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, Claiborne Carson. Dr. Carson, thank you for joining us today. Good to be here with you. Uh, So just starting from the beginning, can you tell us a little bit about the type of family life that Bayard Rustin had growing up? He had grandparents who raised him. They were Quakers. Uh, How did that influence his life in the civil rights and gay rights movements? Well, I I think in some ways that's a part of his life I don't know a lot about, but I understand that he grew up with uh, these strong beliefs from his parents and his family. And uh, I understand that he was a wonderful athlete. Uh, someone who was quite well regarded in in his community, uh, someone who came up with a lot a lot of confidence. Uh, you know, I can't think of any other civil rights leaders who kind of could have made fame as a as a singer or perhaps other fields, but uh, that was definitely the case with him. He was uh, multi talented, and amongst his talents ended up being in organizing. So, how did he develop these talents? Uh, who were his, some of his most important mentors early in his life? A.J. Musty, I guess, would be one of his main advisors. Uh, he got involved in, in uh, movements while he was in college during the 1930s, as many people did, and ultimately uh, became drawn to the uh, pacifist movement. Um, you know, I think that that was his main background. It's, it fit his personality. He wanted to build the uh, movement uh, to, to change the world, but um, through nonviolent means. And um, and I think that was his uh, gift that he brought into the civil rights movement. I mean, he uh, he he felt that he had a background, including going to prison for his beliefs, that qualified him to to um, be a credible leader, someone who could advise someone like a Martin Luther King. And I think his his ability to come to Montgomery and fairly quickly gain. Martin Luther King's confidence, in part because uh, Coretta Scott King had had a background of her own. You know, I think that both of them really influenced Martin Luther King. She was probably more uh, drawn toward the pacifist ideas than Martin was at that time. Uh, She had seen um, Baird Rustin while she was in high school and, uh, of course, trusted him when he arrived in Montgomery. Um, at a time when probably accepting outside advice was a little bit dangerous because you you didn't know whether um, that would hurt the movement. But I think she saw him as a friend of the movement and and that allowed Martin to see him in that role. In the early part of um, the civil rights movement, we were talking in the 30s as things were starting to develop, Rustin briefly joined the Young Communist League, like maybe a number of African-Americans were drawn to initially. What did that experience teach him, and why did he ultimately leave that movement? Well, I, I think, as you mentioned, uh, a, a lot of people became infatuated with communist ideas, in, in part because during the Depression, the economic issues seemed to be paramount. There was a sense of, how can, how can we solve this issue? How can we deal with the number of people who are out of work? How can we reform the economic system so that it provides more opportunities for for workers you know all of these things were prime concerns of of many people who went through the 1930s and and that became paramount in their interests you know that uh, 
even as late as the March on Washington. It was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And they they wanted to make sure that the job issue remained paramount in the movement's concern. And why do you think so many left? You know, there were a number of people that got involved, but then they you know quickly left and founded their own movement. Was there something about communism that made them ed- edgy and wanting to get away from that maybe political politicized group at the time? Well, I, I think that the doctrines were not as attractive as, as, say, the doctrines of the pacifist movement in the sense that it was all about economics and not about other concerns. And I think that that led Rustin and many other people to think that it was wrong just to be narrowly concerned about the economic system, but uh, you needed a, an, an ideology, first of all, that, that didn't rely on revolution as the solution to the problem. Uh, that that was uh, that was something that was obviously not going to be nonviolent, and um, and I think that that's what led them to believe more in the nonviolent ideas. Now, one of the things that's also true is uh, the importance of India and Gandhi. You know that that they saw in the world a nonviolent alternative in the uh, anti-colonial struggle. And um, the fact that Gandhi was having a, a great deal of impact in India, he hadn't succeeded yet, but he certainly showed that there was another way of achieving greater equity in the world, of ending colonial, colonialism. It didn't have to be nonviolent. Um, it didn't have to be violent. It could be overthrown through nonviolent means. Uh, so that was an important lesson for a, a lot of people during that time. And, you know, part of why we're talking about this Bayard Rustin for this episode is obviously the new movie that uh, is receiving critical acclaim. In that movie, it mentions a moment in Rustin's past where he was sort of permanently disfigured after being um, beaten by police after refusing to take a back seat in the bus. This was obviously passive, nonviolent resistance. Can you talk maybe if you have any um, knowledge of the experience that he had, or why Rustin believed so deeply in nonviolent resistance despite the violence? Well, all I could say on that is that it takes a lot of courage to respond nonviolently. You know, I I've gone through some similar experiences, and and I can tell you it it is difficult for me. It was during what was called the Watts riot. I called it a rebellion, but uh, I remember getting hit by a policeman. And you know, part of the part of my nonviolence came from I wasn't going to win a fight violently with a policeman, so it was just made a lot more sense. But I guess uh, for many people like Rustin, it was a philosophy, not just a, a tactic. It was something that they truly believed in and were willing to give their lives for. And uh, and I think it's something that grew stronger over the over the years that he began to see that that was not just the best way of responding to injustice, but the wisest way. It was, it was the way that was going to ultimately, ultimately win. And uh, it was going to win because you, you didn't reduce yourself to the level of your opponent. And one of the other people involved that was, I think, sort of kind of a mentor figure for Rustin was the labor union leader, A. Philip Randolph. What was their relationship like? How did they meet? What did they learn or gain from each other? Well, Rustin, I think, was a a very energetic person who could help A. Philip Randolph. By that time, he was a pretty uh, mature uh, leader. And uh, when he, I guess I'd just call him older leader, when he wanted to get President Roosevelt uh, to allow black workers to get many of the jobs in the war industries, he used the threat of a nonviolent march in, in Washington. This is before World War I, before the United States gets involved in World War I. And, uh, and that threat was something that turned out to be effective. It, it didn't get, uh, it did get many black workers jobs in the war industries, particularly out here in California seaport industries. So I guess that that was, for Rustin, his way of proving his value to uh, A. Philip Randolph, 
And that idea of the March on Washington as a way of putting pressure on the president, of course, is something that uh, returns in the 1960s, uh, when, again, you have a, a president who might be persuaded to join, to uh, support the movement, but maybe needed a little bit of a push that a march could provide. Randolph didn't have to actually have the march. It was just the threat of the march. But I think for Ruston, it was something that, that really needed to happen. And it needed to happen on a very large scale. That march, by the way, was, was my introduction to the movement. It was, uh, I was 19 years old at that time and managed to find a, a way of getting a ride there. And it was, well, one way of putting it is when I, when I got there, I saw all these people. I, I later found that 200,000 was the population of the state I was living in. That was New Mexico at the time. And to see all of them together was more people than, by far than I'd seen in all my life. The notion that this could, could have been organized. You know, I wasn't able to meet um, Baird Rustin, um, but I met other people. I remember Stokely Carmichael, one of the people I met, and he, he had actually tried to persuade me not to go. He said, that, you know, why go to that picnic? You know, why don't you join us in the, in the South? And I didn't want to tell him that uh, going to the picnic was the most radical thing I'd done in my life. And uh, it was, it was uh, really an experience that you know, really changed the course of my life. I knew that once I had been there, this was bigger than anything I was likely to ever experience. And I wanted to be connected to that movement. That's incredible. I definitely want to touch back on that when we reach that moment in history. But you mentioned Martin Luther King earlier as somebody who was arrested and Martin Luther King being important to each other. Can you talk about how they met and what their relationship was like? Well, Rustin was a, among a number of people who came to Montgomery after the bus boycott started. And all of them wanted to advise Martin Luther King because you can, you can imagine, here is the largest black movement of that time, and here is a young minister who's never led a movement before, and you see a number of people basically saying, don't blow this opportunity. You've got to build an effective movement, and it's going to take a, a long time. Um, you know, the movement, the bus boycott movement went on for... 381 days, and um, to have it led by a minister in his mid-20s who had never led such a movement was almost uh, an impossible thought, and, and I think it was quite useful and necessary that people like Rustin came to Montgomery, uh, offered their services. In Rustin's case, um, I, I think is. But I recall from the stories I've heard that uh, Coretta kind of spoke for him and uh, vouched for him, said that this is a person I, I met in high school and, and you should uh, trust his advice. And, uh, and I think that that relationship was a very strong relationship um, through the Montgomery bus boycott, but also afterwards when Martin began to emerge as a, as a leader not just in Montgomery, but more on a national level, or at least on a Southwide level. And uh, Rustin helped in terms of forming the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which King led. And, uh, and I think that that was, you know, it was interesting that uh, here's the Southern Leadership Council for Black ministers in the South. The idea really came out of New York City, you know, and it came out of people who knew that this was something, a coordinating committee that would help spread the movement from Montgomery to other cities. And working with other ministers, even uh, someone like um, Fred Shuttlesworth in Birmingham. Uh, I recall that he, he wrote a, a letter to Martin saying, uh, we need such a movement in Birmingham. Why don't you come over here and help us build one? And of course, Birmingham eventually came there and found, as uh, Shuttlesworth would have already told him, that 
building a movement in Montgomery compared to Birmingham. Birmingham was much tougher. The resistance was much stronger. Montgomery was kind of on the periphery of the uh, segregationist South, you know, in terms of, you know, the Klan was not as strong there. In Birmingham, not only the Klan was strong, but the police chief, Bull Connor, was fiercely segregationist. The, the governor at that time was George Wallace, a fierce segregationist. Uh, so it was not surprising that King was somewhat reluctant to accept uh, Shuttlesworth advice for a long time. But uh, but I think that he he knew that you know if he won in in Birmingham, and this turned turned out to be true that if you if you could defeat segregation in Birmingham, the battle was in its end stage. You know, that, this was a sign that segregation was was not going to succeed, and it could be overcome. But you know, people died, and uh, it was a struggle that you know it led to the Civil Rights Act, but it also led to the killings of three young black children in the 16th Street Baptist Church. So, I guess there was four. Yeah. It was four, four children who were killed that, that September. So um, so I think it, it, it showed that the segregationist movement was strong, but became a stimulus for the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So amidst all the violence that was going on, as you just talked about, when was the idea of having this large march in Washington, this large peaceful march in Washington sort of started and where was Rustin's role as far as the early stages of planning, you know, this massive march in DC? Well, it didn't start with King, you know, he, he was not um, really that much involved in, in the March plan. And I think my own feeling about it, I, you know, only a lot of the people who could confirm it one way or the other are no longer with us, but, but probably it stayed in, a. Philip Randolph's mind, and certainly Baird Rustin's mind, that this was a way of putting some pressure on the government, and particular, particularly John Kennedy, that he he was very reluctant to introduce civil rights legislation, and Berman, even Birmingham, Birmingham caused him to take a stand, and. Um, and the march was kind of a continuation of that. You know, you have a reluctant president who says that um, what if civil rights legislation doesn't pass? You know, I'll be in worse shape than before. And how is it going to get passed? And I've got other priorities for my administration. So you have a reluctant president and having the march became a way of bringing that pressure to Washington. And uh, and I think that it succeeded in that way. Well, I think it succeeded also because it turned out to be nonviolent. And despite the fact that military forces were brought to, uh, to Washington in case there was violence, but uh, what was striking, you know, for us who were there that day is, is all those people and as far as I know, there weren't any significant acts of violence done at that day. It was it was it was kind of like Stokely Carmichael, Carmichael had told me. It was a picnic. It was it was uh, a day of speeches and singing, and everybody went home. and And as far as I know, there was no violence. So it was it was something that was successful. And. Uh, and I think Baird Rustin's role in it was um, tremendous. You know, I I wouldn't have known about it at the time because I was just a spectator. But I understand that organizing a, an event like that was a, a major victory for him. That he was able to pull together lots of different forces from the labor movement the civil rights movement in different places, 
and all these disparate leaders who all wanted to uh, to speak and uh, trying to to make it so that there would be a mixture of singing and and uh, speeches that people would kind of stick to five to seven minute speeches rather than long speeches. In fact, the only one who broke that rule was Martin Luther King. And I, my understanding is he did it with uh, Baird Rustin's encouragement that he uh, said, well, you're the last speaker. If you want to go a little bit over, it's okay with me. No one's going to come after you. They won't be playing the Oscar music to bring Martin Luther <laughs> King off the lectern. Well, that would have been interesting if that had happened. But, uh, because, you know, as you probably realize that we have the draft of the original speech, and it was a five to seven minute speech. And everything else was extemporaneous. It wasn't the first time he had given a speech about his dream, but he knew it well enough that it could be extemporaneous. And it's interesting today that uh, people still call it the I have a dream speech. It, it wasn't named that by Martin Luther King. To me, it's really interesting because everyone sees it as this, as you said, hugely successful event, sort of this uniting of different factions, as you mentioned, for one peaceful cause. But I don't want to overshadow. There were disagreements, some like big disagreements and up to the organization of the march, right, where not everybody was on board with all the original plans. Do you want to talk at all a little bit about how all those negotiations happened to pull it off to get those different people together? Yeah, it was it was a lot of compromise and and um, bringing, as you mentioned, lots of different people from different perspectives. Uh, you know, the part, probably the march would not have happened without the events in Birmingham. But Fred Shuttlesworth, as I recall, was not among the invited speakers, and he was the leader of the. Um, Birmingham movement. You know, so there was a, a, a mixture. There were people who were kind of organizational leaders at the national level, religious leaders, uh, cultural leaders. Uh, and, and I think that was Rustin's genius of bringing together all of the different elements of what could be called the national civil rights movement. And you know, I I wish that Fred Shuttlesworth had been there, but uh, but I think that it was also the case that they wanted something that would convince one person, and that was John Kennedy, to uh, to get behind the Civil Rights Act. And there was um, a Gallup poll at the time that polled Americans and said that only they found that twenty three percent of Americans who'd heard about the march had a positive view of it. And so it, obviously, in addition to segregationists who would not care or want this at all, some civil rights activists or people who are sort of more pro-civil rights were worried that the march could jeopardize Kennedy's impending or pending civil rights legislation. Can you kind of explain that rationale or how Rustin and the leaders of the march handled that? I don't know if they handled it so much. They, they had faith that the march was going to have a, a good impact. I probably... Kennedy and a lot of his advisors um, were worried to the end that uh, something would go wrong and the Civil Rights Act would not pass. And, you know, we don't know whether it would have. Uh, you know, if, if Kennedy had lived, partly what happened is he was assassinated and Lyndon Johnson became president. And Lyndon Johnson got behind the passage of the act and probably had more skills in Congress than John Kennedy did. You know, it, it's hard to know, but I think that it, it took a lot to get that passed. And those of us who were alive at that time, you know, I think if you'd taken a, a vote, it wouldn't have been unanimous in terms of its chance of, of passage. And I'm glad it did. We went through the same thing with the Voting Rights Act. Um, but I think it, at first, what I recall is that everyone was afraid of the filibuster, that, uh, that that had been used many times to stop civil rights legislation and other kinds of legislation. And it had been an effective tool to stop change. And the fact that it was overcome took a lot of 
maneuvering by people who, like Lyndon Johnson, who had been in the Senate and and kind of understood, you know, how to how to get it through Congress. And of course, it it, it was, in my view, one of the most important pieces of legislation in American history. It certainly ultimately changed the segregation of system because it, it took a while to get it enforced. And of course, you had to deal with the voting rights issue separately. But uh, bringing about desegregation was a fundamental change. You know, it, it was important in the same way that the, you know, when we talk about school segregation, it took a Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, to to begin that change, and it took many, many years to to be finalized. But segregation actually remarkably occurred in fewer years in many cities, and uh, I think a city like Atlanta was ready for it. A city like Birmingham probably took longer, and a lot of the rural South many years before change really came. But at least you had a legal basis for it. And I think the two acts, the 64 Act, the Civil Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act were the fundamental changes of, the, of that decade. And as I said, American history. I want to just come back to the march just for a couple more questions. And we want to talk to you briefly about your experience in the march. But before that, Bayard Rustin you know, his affiliation with the Young Communist League and also whispers about his sexuality. You know, he was the deputy director for A. Philip Randolph. Were there ever concerns about Bayard Rustin's exposure during the march and the planning of it? Well, I think it's it's remarkable that everyone knew about the supposed secret of Rustin's sexual orientation. And so it became kind of, well, we know the other side of it too, that he's an effective organizer. He's a, he's a person who has talents that nobody else has. And, um, you know, at, at, the, at the time, it didn't really bring about the major changes that we would see later in terms of changes in American views about homosexuality. But, but I think, it, you know, looking back, people can see that he played this important role in history. And it was something that, I, I guess the way I would put it is that it was something that was seen as potentially damaging. So it was always a, a source of worry. But nearly everybody I knew about who knew him seemed to accept the bargain. You know, that that was, they probably wished that it wasn't, that he was straight, but not to the point of saying, I'm not going to accept his advice, I'm not going to accept his help. And I think the major thing was, don't get caught. And that was the downtime in his in his life, when he did get caught. And I think that that kind of taught him a lesson, too, that, you know, that he had to recognize that that was, uh, that could not only damage himself, but damage the movement at that time. And for you personally, you were there at the march. We would love to give you a minute to tell us how you felt being there as a witness to history. Well, for me, it was it was something that, you know, I, I was invited to a student conference, the National Student Association meeting that was in Indianapolis, uh, in Indiana, I guess, that year. It was actually on the campus of the University of Indiana. And I, I was offered a ride but with a group from Indianapolis. And I didn't expect to go there. I had no way of getting home, actually. I, um, but I did get a ride to the march. And um, once I got there, I, you know, it was interesting. There, there were 200,000 people, and I didn't see a single person I knew. Yeah, because I just kind of wandered off by myself. I didn't know too many of the people from Indianapolis. And I just kind of wandered around for, you know, the, the march and... It was my first trip to Washington, D.C. It was all new. You know, I was from a small town in New Mexico, and here were all these people, all these black people. I saw far more black people than probably in, in the rest of my life. You know, that, and the, the fact that they were all 
there. They were all in this big event. Uh, one thing I, I do remember was a lot of these people who I'd only seen on television, that included entertainers and you know not just leaders, but actually seeing them in person was a, a major, major point in my life. You know, I, I, I don't know if anything can compare to coming to an event like that because I will never, ever be an event at an event like that with that many stars, with that many prominent individuals all in one place and just seeing the strength of the movement. You know, it might have been Stokely Carmichael's picnic, but I didn't see him there. It was the biggest event in my life. And I was really glad that I went and, and I came away from it thinking, I've, I've got to get find ways of getting involved in this movement, uh, even though I'm living out west. And But I, I knew that I was going to leave that small town and, and end up in a big city. And that's what I did. And before I go to my next question, you mentioned that you didn't have a way home. How did you eventually find your way back home? I hitchhiked. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to say that because the notion of a 19-year-old black kid hitchhiking from Indianapolis to Albuquerque, New Mexico, was something that I would, I would probably punish my kid even today, my son, if he tried something like that. But, you know, once I was there, I felt I could do anything. And and um, fortunately, I, I got back. I didn't have any bad experiences. I got picked up by a number of people who, some of them went out of their way to to help me on my ride. Maybe it was part of the spirit of the march was was because a, a lot of the people who picked me up were, were white, some black. And uh, it was, it was, you know. I actually right now I, I kind of wish that I had a cell phone then <laughs> but I, I could have taken pictures of them or, or done an interview with them and and find out why why are they picking up this this kid on the road um, but but also I should say that people hitchhiked more back in those days and uh, but uh, definitely you know when I when I think about it, it was, it was not something I would ever do again. I'm glad. Oh, sorry. Now, now I know the dangers. Yeah, I'm glad that you made it home safe and sound after that. An incredible experience, too, I can't imagine. Um, and then just we have a couple more questions. Um, just wanted to kind of continue with Bayard Rustin's life. What was his career like after, you know, we have the March, we have the Civil Rights Act passed. What did he get involved with afterwards? Was he more turn his attentions to the gay rights movement? What what was his life like then? I think he turned his life more to the labor movement. I didn't know too much. I tried to interview him you know, when I became a historian and found that he was hard to track down. Hard. So when I was traveling across the country, I just came to his office. I think it was, I seem to remember it was in Philadelphia at that time. But, but in any case, uh, this was during the 1970s, I think. And and I said, well, he's he's busy today. And I said, look, I'm driving across this country. and I've, I've tra traveled thousands of miles. I'm not going to be here forever. Can I sit outside and wait until he comes out and maybe we can have a talk? He knew I was outside and I sat outside for hours and was never able to, to have a conversation with him. And what I sensed is that he had become, by that time, so important, maybe, maybe I could call it self-important, that uh, he didn't have time for this kid out, you know, young person out in the office. But it was, it was sad in, in some ways, because uh, I think he could have added a lot to to my knowledge, and what was so important that he didn't have time for that. But now, now that I know more about his life, I, I can kind of see, yeah, you know, he was too important for that kid out in the office, and he probably did have more important things to do. 
uh, or at least he thought he needed to do. And uh, but it, it's it's part of the complexity, you know, that I I I feel. And who knows what it, what would it have been different if I had been outside Martin Luther King's office trying to get an interview? You find that you know at different times people play different roles, and now I understand that more. I, I would never. I, I hope that I will never be sitting in my office and have have some young person wanting an interview that I never come out and say hello to. So, um, but but that's you know that's my last memory of him is is the fact that I didn't get the interview, and I think that that's probably not atypical of you know so, something that happens in 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 life that you know you you rise to the point where something that you might have done readily earlier becomes kind of beneath you and you know it's it's as i said it's interesting in the sense that i've had so many of the other kind of experiences where some person i kind of modeled as being really important did take the time sit down with me and explain what was going on. And I had the pleasure of meeting so many of the people who were there that day, people like Fred Shuttlesworth, who also didn't get a chance to speak, and John Lewis you know, became a good friend, spoke with Carmichael, and stayed in touch with him until the end of his life. All of these people became part of my life. I want to say thank you for making the time to speak to us. Uh, and as a journalist, I recognize that sometimes you have an interview that you really want to have and sometimes it doesn't work so my empathy and again my thanks that you've um, chosen to make some time for us one last question we have you know this episode is going to air a week before the oscars certainly there are going to be people who are not familiar with the civil rights movement the march on washington who are going to hear bayard rustin's name for the first time be introduced to the character the person he was for the first time on national tv why do you think bayard rustin is someone that should be studied today and that we need to get to know i think he played an important role in what I think was the most important movement of the 20th century. And that is that movement to, to bring about racial reform in, in the United States. You know, everything from the 1954 Supreme Court decision through the assassination of Martin Luther King, you know, that during that time, this country changed in such fundamental ways. And here you have the person who was at the center of that through all of that time. And I, I think that that's remarkable, you know, that we have a chance to kind of understand someone who is fundamentally important and yet not well understood. You know, someone who was there for so much of, of American history, but because of the prejudices uh, that many people have about homosexuality and the gay life kind of refuse to see that. And, um, and I think that that's, that's something, you know, I, I, I compare it in, in some ways to women who were at the center of so many of the important changes. Uh, you know, people like Ella Baker, for example, you know, who were at the center but had to play not at the front of the stage. Supporting roles. Supporting roles, yes. Wonderful word to use. The the supporting players. Coretta would be another example of that. That I I I think because she was not only a woman, but she's the wife of the leader, that people don't seem to understand that it's hard to think of Martin except with Coretta because, you know, you know, one of the ways I put it is that Martin becomes political in 1955 because women in Montgomery organize a movement. Coretta, when she meets Martin, she has been a delegate to a political convention. He has not voted yet. 
you know, you have to kind of see things the way they actually happen, that she's, she's the older partner in this relationship. She's the one who is, in, in a sense, seeing something in him that he probably doesn't even see in it himself because she already is political. And so I think that that's, that's what I think about Rustin is that he allows us to understand that sometimes there are these people who play these important roles and for reasons beyond their control, they have to play these roles by staying in the background, letting somebody else be in the foreground. And I think that that's, that's an important lesson for all of us to learn, that there's always going to be um, the background players who are nonetheless fundamentally important in terms of understanding how change happens. And, and we always find them. And you know, historians love to discover them, <laughs> that, that uh, if, if not for this person who you've never heard of before, a lot of these changes would not have taken place. Well, I think that's that's true of Baird Rustin. Dr. Carson, thank you so much for helping us shed light on one of those background players, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're interested in learning more about the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, check out our podcast page at jfklibrary.org slash jfk35 for images, documents, and oral histories about the march from the JFK Library's archives. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at jfklibrary using the hashtag jfk35. If you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Mm